Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe. So I've had this on my TBR for a while now. I didn't know too much about it other than it could have kind of covered the beat generation. I knew it was non-fiction. It's a very famous title, and uh, it follows Ken Casey and his band of merry pranksters around. Ken Casey being who wrote uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So um, recently I posted uh, a thing on my Instagram, on my Facebook, asking people, you know, this, I said, this is my uh, current TBR, what should I read next? And uh, this one with two votes, Everyone, everything else just got one vote. So um, yeah, I'm going to read the blurb if there is one. I don't think there is one. Well, anyway, I gave you a bit of a blurb there. So let's just jump right, right in and check out some of my tabs. Dane reads. So near the start we get um, this guy juggling sledgehammers and someone says, who's that? That's Cassidy. This strikes me as a marvellous fact. I remember Cassidy. Cassidy, Neil Cassidy, was the hero Dean Moriarty of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. The Denver kid, a kid who was always racing back and forth across the US by car, chasing or outrunning life. And here is the same guy, now 40, in the garage, flipping a sledgehammer, rocketing about to his own Joe Cuba and talking. Cassidy never stops talking, but that is a bad way to put it. Cassidy is a monolinguist, only he doesn't seem to care whether anyone is listening or not. He just goes off on the monologue by himself if necessary, although anyone is welcome aboard. He will answer all questions, although not exactly in that order, because we can't stop here, next rest area 40 miles, you understand. Spinning off memories, metaphors, literary, oriental, hip illusions, all punctuated by the unlikely expression, you understand. And we get this, uh, Casey has to go for like a doctor's exam and he's high on acid, so uh, Casey was soaring on LSD and his sense of time was wasted and thousands of thoughts per second were wrapping around between synapses, fractions of a second, so what the hell is a minute? But then one thought stuck in there, held, malicious, delicious. He remembered that his pulse had been running 75 beats a minute every time they took it, so when Dr. Fogg says go, Casey slyly slides his slithering finger onto his pulse and counts up to his 75 and says now. Dr. Smog looks at his stopwatch. Amazing, he says, and walks out of the room. You said it, bud, but like a lot of other people, you don't even know. We get a reference to Casey working on his book, Sometimes a Great Notion, which was almost 300,000 words long. That is long. I mean, the stand uncut is about 440,000, so it's two thirds of the stand. And a little reference to Martha and the Vandellas, which is a great band. And they meet up with uh, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg as well. So there's a lot of stuff in here if you're into uh, you know beat poetry and beat writing. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here for you to like. And we get here a reference to Max Weber. He says, uh, you can be an ethical prophet like Jesus or Moses who outlines rules of conduct for his followers and describes God as a super person who passes judgment on how they live up to the rules. Or you can be an exemplary prophet like Buddha. For him, God is unpersonal, a force, an energy, a unifying flow, an all-in-one. The exemplary prophet does not present rules of conduct. He presents his own life as an example for his followers. And Casey basically has his own cult, the Merry Pranksters. You know, there's like this hippie commune thing going on with Casey at the head. And they're taking a lot of acid. We get a reference to uh, Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, which is currently also on my unread bookshelf, so I should read that soon. And I want to read this bit out here. This is sort of some of Casey's teachings, I suppose. A person has all sorts of lags built into him, Casey is saying. One, the most basic, is the sensory lag. The lag between the time your senses receive something and you're able to react. One thirtieth of a second is the time it takes, if you're the most alert person alive, and most people are a lot slower than that. Now, Cassidy is right up against that one thirtieth of a second barrier. He is going as fast as a human can go, but even he can't overcome it. He is a living example of how close you can come, but it can't be done. You can't go any faster than that. You can't through sheer speed overcome the lag. We are all of us doomed to spend our lives watching a movie of our lives. We are always acting on what has just finished happening. It happened at least one thirtieth of a second ago. We think we're in the present, but we aren't. The present we know is only a movie of the past, and we will really never be able to control the present through ordinary means. That lag has to be overcome some other way, through some kind of total breakthrough. And there are all sorts of other lags besides that go along with it. There are historical and social lags where people are living by what their ancestors or somebody else perceived, and they may be 25 or 50 years or centuries behind, and nobody can be creative without overcoming all those lags first of all. A person can overcome that much through intellect or theory or study of history and so forth and get pretty much into the present that way, but he's still going to be up against one of the worst lags of all, the psychological. Your emotions remain behind because of training, education, the way you were brought up, blocks, hang-ups and stuff like that, and as a result your mind wants to go one way but your emotions don't. 
We also get a reference to Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, so I have read that one. And then, uh, then we get the Hell's Angels, but it's stylized in this with an apostrophe, H-E-L-L -L apostrophe S. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate over whether where that apostrophe should go. And actually, apparently, according to the Hell's Angels on their official website, um, there's like a FAQ saying um, about that missing apostrophe. Yes, it is missing, but it is not missed by us. So Hell's Angels to be like officially on brand or whatever there's no apostrophe at all in it so they tried to get the Beatles involved in this movie they're making as well and they go and see the Beatles but they're on a lot of acid and there are just loads of screaming girls so it, it must have been kind of terrifying to be honest and it says um no one lays a hand on them or says the first words thousands of cops are not even one hassle because we're too obvious Basically, they're so clearly off their tits on acid that the cops are like, no one would be that stupid. And then Jerry Garcia shows up and we get this great quote. All I know, he announces into the din, is that if I were a cop and I came in here, I wouldn't know where to begin. Uh, we also get some references to, to some more books here. So, um, nothing to read here, but the Nova Express by William Burroughs, the Nietzsche and Dostoevsky that Casey has, and in the Bible. Everybody goes through Dover Express in a couple of hours, but the Bible, they can linger over. So yeah, overall, uh, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe. I mean, this is like a must read if you're into the Beats and Ken Casey and Neil Cassidy and Allen Ginsberg and all those lot. I gave it like, I would say a week, four out of five. I did appreciate the way it was quite often written in a beat style as well, and it was generally quite interesting. And again, if you're interested in like psychedelic drugs and all that kind of stuff, you might enjoy it as well. So yeah. So there we have it, that's what I made of the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.